On episode nine of Office Hours with Dr. Guy, we talk about the research gap, software, and finding great committee members. Bring your questions to Office Hours with Dr. Guy. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours with Dr. Guy. It is Monday early in the morning, and I love Mondays. So these past eight episodes have been really exciting, and this is a threshold episode for us. Episode 10 is going to be very different. I've been teasing this up for the last three episodes, and I'm very excited for what I have whole, held there for you. And so make sure you watch those opening, especially those opening minutes of episode 10. You're going to love what you have to see. And uh, without much Further ado, let's answer some of your questions. Samuel asks, how do I find the research gap I want to fill? Samuel, welcome to the show. It is so good to be able to answer your question. Thank you for commenting. So the research gap is by far one of the most interesting animals when it comes to the dissertation process because every student feels like they're looking for it. And what they end up often finding, every candidate discovers that the research gap is more of finding something that's not there, which is very difficult. And so that becomes a very confusing process for most candidates. And what I want you to know is that approach is completely wrong. If, if you think, or if anyone thinks, not you personally, Samuel, but anyone who thinks that the research gap is like a blank space in the literature, that's a very limited understanding of what the research gap is. And in fact, it's not gonna to lead towards you being able to finish this dissertation project thoroughly and properly, fast and well. The research gap, put really simply, is what researchers say they want us to know. Because researchers over time have pointed out that we don't know this particular thing. Now, what do re how do researchers tell us what they don't know? The number one place that you need to be looking for your literature, literature review and to discover this thing called the research gap is in chapter five of other people's dissertations. You should be downloading dozens and dozens and dozens of other dissertations about similar topics that are side by side to yours and see what the researchers there in chapter five under the recommendations for study have recommended. Additionally, in journal articles, often at the end, you will see some final summative questions that the researchers have posed, and you want to make sure that you're cataloging them as well. Basically, the research gap is what other researchers are telling us that we should know or we would want to know. The research gap is not an absence of literature about a certain topic, because think about it, if the bar is it's missing. Well, for most doctoral candidates, there's a large period of time where you can't find anything <laughs> about your topic. And so for that reason, that can't be the research gap. The research gap is what other researchers are asking you to know. And in fact, your purpose statement should be catering to the questions of what researchers are asking us to know. That is the foundation of a great dissertation, is having a great purpose statement that is founded in the questions being asked by researchers today, recently, around your topic. So dig into those dissertations, Samuel, and let me know what you find. What recommendations for research, recommendations for study, are at the end of those dissertations? Latifa asks, what software tools and programs are most useful for writing the dissertation? Latifa, a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Thanks for commenting. You're not going to like my answer for this, which is uh, not much. It really, fancy tools, you know, I can name a few. I, I'm not a big fan, and here's the reason why. Because it distracts from the essential process that, that really has to be going on when you're writing a dissertation. For me, Excel, Microsoft Word, that's, that's the extent of, of the tools that I would use for the dissertation. Because what are you really doing? At the earliest stage of the dissertation process, what you're doing is you are doing the, the reading, uh, the literature search. I have an awesome video 
about how to conduct a literature review, and I'm going to link it up below. And please do make sure that you take a look at that. And the process really is you gathering quotes and you putting them into some kind of matrix that is organizable. Scrivener, uh, I think there's one called Latex. There's a number of other pro products that are out there that are fantastic products. And for, you know, for writing in general, I think that they're wonderful tools. For myself, though, in terms of the dissertation process, in my opinion, I, they're just not useful to me because what I want to be able to do is I want to keep things uber simple. I want to have to learn a new piece of software. And Excel, the learning curve is so small because in, in terms of creating a literature matrix, you're only putting text in cells. So there's not a lot of learning that has to occur there. What am I looking for? I'm looking for something that organizes quotes, something that, that can keep a list of quotes running and that I can sort by column. That's what I want. And uh, the tools that I just mentioned definitely have the ability to sort items and sort quotes. And, and there's many other software tools out there that will do that. But I think the key is Latifa. We don't want to be distracted from what's important. What's important is just simply taking quotes and getting them down into the software itself. And if getting a new piece of software is going to distract us from that, I don't think it's worth it personally. I've seen so many candidates uh, using online software tools that organize their quotes for them or keeps their sources organized for them and then disaster strikes, the, the school updates their database, the account gets lost, all of a sudden months and months and months of work are gone. I always want there to be a central file on your computer and frankly I'd like it to be a file that's only like something where you could see all on one page everything that you've gathered and Excel is really great for that. How plain is it? You can look at Excel and say wow I've gathered and you go down to the, the, the row and you can say wow I've gathered 380 quotes, uh, 20 to go uh, to have a really solid uh, foundation for my literature review. So my recommendation is, is um, if you can, don't bother. If you absolutely must, uh, the question you have to ask yourself is, is this truly what I need to be doing right now, or is this a distraction? And not for you, Latifa, but there's so many people, so many candidates that are watching this right now, that they're going to do everything else except for actually reading stuff and actually gathering quotes. And I can tell you that that is the only thing that makes, process, uh, that makes progress in the dissertation world is actually reading stuff, gathering those quotes, organizing them, and finally writing your final draft. Those are the only tasks that will actually f help you finish the dissertation. Gathering software, writing emails to chair, uh, things like this, these are all extraneous activities that definitely could help, but they're not actually writing your dissertation. So my recommendation would be Get some books, get some dissertations, start there, go into Excel, and uh, look back on my previous video about literature reviews, and look at the video I've linked up below, watch that, get a feel for the process, and start gathering those quotes as much as you can. And Latifa, if the software will help you, use it. But if in the end, after a couple days, you're like, oh, this is just another thing that's distracting me, you might have learned a $60 lesson, but at least you know what to do and what not to do going forward. Thanks for the question. Omar asks, what are your thoughts about finding and selecting committee members? Omar, welcome to the show, how are you? Finding and selecting committee members, depending on what school, what doctoral program you're in, this could either be a very simple process or an exceedingly difficult one. Here's where it's really simple. If you can get face-to-face -face access with potential committee members, that is the best scenario possible. However, those of you that are online or remote only, finding committee members can be one of the most disruptive, difficult tasks in the world. So first of all, I want to set, no matter what program you're in, I want to set some global goals. Number one, you want to select committee members, hopefully, that are, now this, listen, this is just the fast track here. So if you want to go uber uh, amazing here and you want to write the work of your life, then uh, this might not be the recommendation for you. But if you're looking to finish your dissertation and get your doctoral degree, then this is what I recommend. Number one, make sure that you are only selecting committee members that are currently teaching at your doctoral program. And the reason for that is because they're immediately accessible and they're already in the system. Some of you might want to select outside committee members that are outside your doctoral program or even outside the university altogether. 
There's an onboarding process that typically has to occur. There's a training process they must go through. There's signed releases and there's other paperwork typically that a committee member might have to go through. And that can take six months or many months of your committee member having to work to be on your dissertation. And that's what you don't want them to do. You want your committee member to be able to make, make an easy yes and for them to quickly sign a form and for you guys to have an agreement that you guys have some kind of shared interest but that you're working towards the common goal of getting this dissertation done as soon as possible. So uh, that's the global rule number one. Gro global rule number two, you want to make sure that all the committee members that you've selected are naturally not going on sabbatical anytime soon. They're not going to be going away for summer research in Asia. They're not going away to the far reaches of the planet uh, away from you. And that, in fact, they're interested in seeing you through this process, whether it takes you know, typically 18 months to 24 months if you're serious about the dissertation process and you're working you know, many hours a week on it. And so there's that. And so those are the two global rules. So let's talk about the on-ground uh, hybrid sort of doctoral programs. Uh, you want to get face-to-face -face access with committee members of any kind. Uh, you want to see if there's some mutual interest there. You want to like their personalities if possible. And you want to get them in as quickly as you can. If you like their personality and you feel like there's some common ground there and they fit those two global rules that I've just mentioned, get them in. Have them sign the form. If you can, get them to sign the form live right there. Uh, if that's not possible because you don't have a relationship with them already, naturally you want to email them. You want to say hello. You want to keep those emails really short. And uh, this actually goes for both online and hybrid and, and on ground. You want to keep your emails really short. Tell them who you are, what you're doing, no more than five sentences, and then give them a writing sample and then ask to speak with them via phone. It's that quickly. When it comes to on ground hybrid, uh, you can speak with them on the phone and then you say, hey, I'll see you at the next, you know, and typically cohorts meet in doctoral programs eight for every eight to 12 weeks or so. And so what you would probably do, or every semester at least, so what I would do then is I would meet with them face to face and say, hey, we talked on the phone, you've already seen my writing sample, could we get this in, on solid and paper and have them sign the form right there. Now, if we're talking online, it's a lot more difficult. So, I mean, Omar, imagine this. I mean, imagine you've never met your committee member, and chances are the only interaction with them that you'll ever will have, it's going to be through online interaction, maybe one or two phone calls at most, um, maybe, maybe a presentation that you're making to them at proposal and at defense. So getting those types of committee members is much more difficult. So my recommendation there is always to seek the easiest road. Uh, if, you're in an, and if you're in an online doctoral program, you want to make sure you're selecting only people that fit those two global rules that I mentioned, and you also want to select them as quickly as possible. You want to basically uh, talk to your chair first and see if they have people they can recommend. Regardless, either way, uh, quick emails and getting a phone call with these people and sending them a writing sample and making an easy yes is absolutely a necessity. But the, but the key, I think, with the online world, in my humble opinion, is you can't be too choosy. Because think about it, most of these committee members in the online only community, online hybrid, where you're mostly doing your interactions online, you're going to end up actually, uh, th th those committee members are probably receiving dozens of emails every day, if not many, many, many more every week. And they're asking, uh, people are asking them to be their committee members all the time. So you standing out is really important. Short emails, include the writing sample, include a photo of yourself. Uh, if you are one of these types of people, do a short one or two minute video on YouTube about who you are and what you're interested in. And let that be the, the quick introduction. Make the interaction as fast and as clean as possible. Get them signed up with you and then you're, you're good to go. Now some people are watching this saying, wow, uh, isn't this a really important decision? And shouldn't we go a little bit slower? The answer is, of course, yes. It is a very important decision. And you should go as slow as necessary to make the right and proper decision. If you're, like I, in the first group, if you're you know, in, a, in a, a hybrid or an on-ground community, making this decision is really simple. You've known these professors for some time. And so being able to reach out to them and make a request, that's a very quick thing. Now, if you're online uh, and maybe you only interact with professors twice a year, then this becomes a much more difficult proposition. There's really uh, very little you can do to get to know these people in the way that you're desiring unless 
you somehow know of their research uh, or know of their contribution to scholarly, the scholarly world elsewhere, there's very little you're probably going to know about them. And so for that reason, it's a lot more difficult to make this type of decision. In the end, you have to decide for yourself, how much time are you looking to spend in this? You want to select a committee member that's going to enable you to finish well. You don't want to select the committee member that has the best you know, biography necessarily, unless that's a major advantage to you. Some of you are hustling for future jobs and future positions. And then that's where you make the trade-off. You say, wow, I want to work with this researcher that I really appreciate, but they're going to take some time uh, to get on my, you know, on, my, on my team. And it's going to take a lot of effort. And if you're looking to hustle like that and get your next job or your next promotion or whatever you're looking for by using an amazing committee member that might not be as accessible as others, then go and do that. But if you're one of those, like the many that are watching this, that are trying just to finish this process quickly and well, then you want to find a committee member that can help you get on board quickly and well and help you finish quickly and well. So Omar, in the end, you ask your heart, is this the best person for me? And if you don't think, if you get this any feeling like, uh, I don't know if this is really the best person for me, the answer is no. But if you say, you know what, this person's great, good enough, get them in. Unless you want to hustle and you want to get that next job uh, or that next position, then hustle for those top key players. But chances are you'll be fine with just committee members that are accessible to you right here, right now, today. So everybody, it's been an amazing quick episode nine. I hope you really appreciate it. Check out episode 10. I have some amazing stuff that you are going to appreciate there. Episode 10 is the place. It's the time for change. And in episode 10, uh, well, I'm not going to give it away. You're going to like it. So besides that, uh, besides all that, uh, what I'd like to know is I'd like to know who else is giving you information right now about your dissertation process. You know, are you reading some books? Are you watching some videos? Are you collaborating with some kind of coach or expert online? Let me know. I'd like to know who are these people that you're reaching to for advice besides myself. And I'd like to know who are the voices of light in your life as you're going through this dissertation process. Have a blessed Monday. It's always a pleasure. See you in episode 10. And make sure you subscribe or like this video because I sleep better when I know that people are watching this show.